so very glad to have you join us today. We're going to start first with hearing from the interpreters so that everyone can be together in our conversation. We're very fortunate today to have Spanish, uh, Kurdish to Spanish and back and Kurdish to English. Uh, interpreters. So I'm going to first, before we get started with our commentary, uh, ask uh, Soyeri and Aldo 
Uh, would you like to share instructions? Yes, thank you. I'll be giving this announcement in English and Spanish. You will also see uh, the instructions in Kurdish in the chat. Sí, gracias. Daré este anuncio en español y en inglés. También verán las instrucciones en kurdo en el chat. Hello, my name is Aldo, and I'm here with my colleagues Sayuri, Jalil, and Nora. And today we will provide simultaneous interpretation into Spanish, English, and Kurdish. Hola, mi nombre es Aldo y estoy aquí con mis colegas Sayuri, Jalil y Nora y vamos a proveer interpretación simultánea al español, inglés y kurdo. We're going to ask everyone uh, who will be participating to please speak at a moderate pace, like I am doing right now, and loudly and clearly into your microphones to make interpretation easier. Le vamos a pedir a todas las personas que van a participar que por favor hablen a un ritmo moderado, como lo estoy haciendo yo ahora, y en voz alta y clara en sus micrófonos para facilitar la interpretación. We have already activated the interpretation function on Zoom, so you should be able to see a globe icon at the bottom of the screen. To listen to the interpretation, click on the globe and select your language of choice, that is either English, Spanish, or Kurdish. If you do not um, speak all three languages, you will need to turn on the interpretation. Ya hemos activado la función de interpretación en Zoom, así que usted podrá ver el icono de un globo terráqueo en la parte inferior de la pantalla. Para acceder a la interpretación, por favor, dele un clic en el globo terráqueo, seleccione su idioma eh, que prefiera, ya sea español, inglés o kurdo. Si usted no domina los tres idiomas, tiene que acceder a la interpretación. Now, if you're joining us on your smartphone or tablet, click on the three dots at the bottom right where it says more. Select language interpretation, select your language, and finally click where it says done so you can start listening to the interpretation when someone speaks a language you do not. Eh, si, ahora, si usted se está conectando desde su teléfono inteligente o tableta, dele clic en los tres puntitos que se encuentran en la parte inferior a mano derecha donde dice más. Seleccione interpretación de idiomas, seleccione el idioma que usted prefiera y dele clic en donde dice finalizar para que usted pueda escuchar eh, a la interpretación al idioma que usted prefiera cuando alguien hable los idiomas que usted no domine. Um, uh, finally, if you have any questions, please feel free to write in the chat and someone should be able to assist you. Thank you and have a great session. Uh, por último, si tiene algún problema para conectarse a la interpretación, con toda confianza escriba un comentario en el chat y alguien podrá uh, apoyarle. Gracias y que tengan una excelente sesión. Thank you, Aldo. Uh, Chelil Honora. Is there anything you would like to add? Thank you. We open this session here with full awareness that this moment is one of greatly heightened brutality of a system in decline, yet also the full consciousness of the extraordinary resistance evident in this moment. Let us all take a deep breath in and out. As I open this discussion by stating all power to the people in Palestine, in Rojava, in Congo, in Haiti, and all over the world who are facing the most brutal front of the decline of the colonial, capitalist, heteronormative patriarchy. It is only a matter of time. As Grace Lee Boggs would say, we know what time it is on the clock of the world. We also note that today in the US is Black Solidarity Day and we draw much strength from the Black radical internet, internationalist tradition. I want to note that the co-sponsors, Genealogy Academy, Civil Diplomacy Center, May First Movement Technology, Global Tapestry of Alternatives, and uh, Women's Assembly. Much thanks to Jamie May First of May First and others from May First, Shauna Carol Rocks from APC, 
our speakers, our interpreters, our note takers, our uh, Rojava crew who have helped put together this session and flyer designer um, extraordinaire, Matt. I also give thanks to all present here. This, this session is actually a conversation in the making over the last couple years between uh, uh, folks in Rojava um, and May 1st about the role of tech in warfare. And then through the Global Tapestry of Alternatives Assembly in August and the recent escalations made it at ever more urgent. I share with you briefly the program sequence, then the bios, and we're off to hear uh, words from uh, our three speakers. This is the intro. The speakers will, will then share their thoughts and respond to three prepared questions. We'll then open for a question and answer and comment and we ask that you put your questions in the chat as we have many people here, many questions and relatively short time in this conversation. And then we have a closing from uh, our friends in Rojava. Our three speakers, Sira is a representative of the Women's Congress Congress Star in Rojava. She is a women's right and Kurdish rights activist who grew up in the Kurdish diaspora and moved back to Kurdistan after the revolution began in Rojava. She is a member of Congress Star and works especially in the Information and International Relations Center. Center. She will inform us about the present occupation attacks of the Turkish state and the people's resistance for life and freedom. Ken Montenegro is co-chair of May 1st Movement Technology Board. He is a technologist, lawyer, and movement factotum. He is past vice president of the National Lawyers Guild and technology director at the Center for Constitutional Rights. He will speak to us about technology as a means of colonialism and warfare against progressive movements and the possibilities to protect and connect women's and people's freedom struggles worldwide. Abba Bahia from Jakori Rural, Global Tapestry of Alternatives and Women's Assembly and Vilkap Sangam, a feminist activist, researcher and institution builder Abba works and lives in the Himalayan mountains. Following a path of nonviolence and simplicity, Jagori Rural is committed to building a just and equitable society and actively working in nearly 250 villages in India on issues of violence against women, health and well being, awareness and rights. Abba will share thoughts about possibilities to weave structures of solidarity and resistance against different forms of war, violence, and occupation. Much thanks. We now turn first to Stara, then Ken, and then Abba, who will each speak for roughly 10 minutes. Stara. Thank you, Melanie, for the introduction. So I will uh, talk now about the recent attacks. But before uh, I start, for those who might not know much about uh, Rojava or North and East Syria, I would like to explain it uh, shortly. So uh, Rojava means uh, West in Kurdish, and it uh, uh, refers to the West part of Kurdistan that lies within the Syrian state borders. So it lies in Northern Syria. And uh, since the conflict in uh, Syria 2011, the people of Rojava have taken an alternative way, an alternative, yani, we call it the third path, neither on the side of the Syrian regime nor on the side of the Western inter inter interventions and the groups they supported, uh, many of which have turned out to be uh, Islamic uh, jihadists. So the third path we have 
taken was and is uh, the women's revolution, a revolution and a establishment of a system based on a democratic, equal and ecological justice society. It is a women's revolution, not only because uh, women are a driving force uh, of this revolution in all areas of life, but because we are convinced that the society can be free if the woman in society is free, if patriarchy and with it capitalism and all other forms of oppression are overcome. So during uh, the fight against the Islamic State, uh, other regions in Eastern Syria were also liberated and now uh, self-governing within the autonomous administration of North and East Syria. And the administration is organized on a federal basis and consists of uh, seven regions. The system here is based on the idea of the democratic nation, uh, which was inspired by Abdullah Öcalan. And the most important elements of this administration are the communes and the councils, and as well as the inclusion of all religious and ethnic groups in the region. And uh, we understand Turkey's attacks uh, attacks directed against this democratic system, against uh, the women's revolution. And the fascist Turkey's intensive attacks last month were justified by an, uh, by an action carried out by the PKK in Ankara two days before the uh, attack started. But, um, but that is not the real reason or not a reason at all because Turkey has been waging a war against uh, the people here since the beginning of the Syrian conflict, since the beginning of the revolution. So in the past, Turkey also had supported uh, different uh, jihadist groups like Jabhat al-Nusra, like the Islamic States to attack the region. Um, they supported them ideologically, logistically, and financially for Example, we uh, we have seen in the fight in Kobani that Turkey has opened its borders to the Islamic State to cross to Rojava and fight there against the uh, 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 the YPJ and the YPG. So and the stop yeah and, and the attacks never stopped uh, and Turkey also started to not just uh, attack the region with proxy uh, yani uh, in a proxy war with groups with other groups but. Uh, the the military the Turkish military is also uh, attacking uh, directly and since 2020 the fascist Turkish state has uh, started uh, uh, and waging a drone war uh, they especially targeting uh, people who are key figures in building the democratic system who are like, taking important role in uh, this women's revolution and uh, Yes, uh, in the first drone attack of this kind, uh, three members of our organization of Congress Star uh, were attacked in a civilian house in Kobani while they were preparing for their conference and while they were um, uh, organizing women in the villages. So there you can also see that the aim of the attacks are direct, I mean, they're directed, directed against the women's revolution especially. And also now um, regarding the intense intensified offensive of last month, it can be assumed that the Turkish state wants to create new realities, no new facts in the region, uh, because the time uh, where, when the attacks were carried out is also important. Uh, the attacks were carried, uh, carried out during an operation by the Syrian Democratic Forces in Derazor. I don't know if you hear about it, but uh, they are like ISIS, uh, Islamic State cells and other mercenary groups were causing unrest in the region and there were like uh, operation against it uh, for more stability. And also a big top a topic now in the region is the notion, the, the new uh, social contract of the autonomous administration. And it, it's just, it was just about to be introduced. It's, it's one year, uh, it was drafted, discussed in the different uh, in different parts of society, in the communes, in the councils, in uh, institutions with the different ethnic groups, and these are like things who, yeah, I mean, what happened here is like to to stabilize and develop the situation here, and whenever uh, the situation improves or stabilizes in, in North and East Syria, Turkey is uh, attacking the region, and this we saw also in past invasion offensives. 
like for example, uh, Afrin was occupied violently two in 2018, and this occupation started like shortly before, uh, after shortly after the Syrian Democratic uh, Forces declared the liberation of Raqqa from ISIS, from the Islamic State. So Raqqa was the capital of ISIS, and in uh, 2019. Uh, Grispi and Serekani were also violently occupied after the liberation of Deir Azur. And Deir Azur was uh, the region where ISIS ruled, it was the last region where ISIS ruled. So also the last month's uh, attacks starting on October 4, uh, fascist Turkish, uh, Turkey attacked the region with drones, warplanes, artillery and uh, other heavy weapons. And they attacked the whole entry border region. And shortly before they started the attacks, the Turkish defense minister declared in a public statement uh, that they will attack and explained that the first phase of this attacks would especially targeting, uh, they would especially target infrastructure. And they also did so. And now I will, um, mentioned some uh, numbers and uh, from attacks from the October 4 to October 11 alone in this days Turkish uh, occupation army attacked more than 224 targets with more than 300 304 air and ground attacks uh, they bombed infrastructures such as uh, 11 targets like uh, power plants electricity distribution centers affecting uh, more than 2 million people who uh, left without electricity. <clears throat> they have bombed 17 petrol stations, oil fields and oil refiner refineries, uh, affecting uh, more than 5 uh, million people. And especially now the winter is coming and uh, heating uh, possibilities or opportun uh, options are very limited in the region. So without electricity and without uh, without oil, it will be very uh, com yeah, complicated. They also targeted water supply and water transfer stations to hospitals and to uh, weed silos. And the destruction of the uh, destruction of and the damage of vital civilian infrastructure facilities caused a material damage worth more than 1 billion uh, US dollar. And at this time also they uh, attacked an Asaish Academy uh, of the drug crime drug crime department. Uh, and and this and the Asaish is the internal security forces uh, in the region. And 29 members of the Asaish were martyred in uh, this attack. Uh, 47 uh, citizens were killed and more than uh, 59 people were injured. Uh, some schools were temporarily closed and the attacks are still continuing. Artillery shellings and uh, drone attacks uh, haven't stopped since. <clears throat> and Turkey is trying to spread fear and panic among the population. They want to force people here to flee and uh, depopulate the region uh, so that they they are preparing for a ground for for a new ground offensive ground offensive for a new invasion. And uh, I just uh, want to also not connect but or don't put it in uh, in um, compare but i think the war in gaza and uh, in israel and uh, the turkish attacks started around the same time is probably not a coincidence uh, as hamas uh, st said or stated publicly the the attack on israel has been planned for a long time and turkey knew about it and there are also parallels between the Israeli attacks on Gaza and Turkey's, att Turkey's attacks on northern Syria. Of course, I don't want to compare it in terms of scale, but uh, I think there are similars in the approach of the attacks or of the approach of the both states. And of course, Turkey is also taking advantage of the fact that the media intention is focused on the war in Gaza. And Erdogan is also uh, the Turkish uh, uh, president is uh, 
uh, is condemning that Israel is attacking infrastructure and civilian structures, but they are doing the same way uh, here. And we can say that we are currently uh, yeah, in the Third World War with the Middle East in its center. And we think that the only solution for this conflict and th this wars in the Middle East can only be a democratic solution from the region itself. And the alternative system we have built here in Rojava can be or is, could be a role model for the entry region. But this alternative model of the democratic nation is seen uh, by the capitalists and nationalist states as a threat to their interests. So uh, this is also why the region is attacked, is under attack. Uh, but we are ready to defend. Uh, and we saw also saw that the people in Rojava in northern East Syria were re ready to resist and to defend uh, the system they already built up, the achievements uh, they built up. And um, we saw it also that there were a lot of uh, demonstrations and the, the people didn't uh, uh, flee, flee from the region. So they didn't, the, Turkey didn't achieve their goals with the attacks, but yes, uh, and the people are still resisting. I think I'm with the time, it's done or okay. There will be more after, uh, shortly. Ken, you can go right ahead. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, then just for, I, I would be finished, but if I have still time, I would say, uh, okay. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, then uh, I would say it's also important to, to mention um, the, I also mentioned the resistance of the peoples here, but uh, there is, uh, have been, uh, seen also a media war, 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 warfare is also taking place. And there have been international uh, internet censures by Turkey, critical voices in Turkey who speak out against the attacks have been arrested. And uh, lies were spread in the Turkish media that the YPG and the Syrian Democratic Forces are fighting alongside the Israeli army against the Palestinian people like, uh, Turkish media is full of uh, this kind of news, uh, false propaganda to to legitimate uh, the attacks uh, on the region on uh, northern East Syria on Rojava also in their own um, in their own society. Um, yes, and uh, but we see that. Uh, we had a problem uh, really because I'm also we are also making information work and in, uh, with uh, in, with the, uh, from the ground and also with the women's movement, and we saw that it was very difficult to break through this uh, media embargo uh, because the focus of uh, uh, the media, the public awareness, was uh, focused on the war in Gaza, so it was very easy for T Turkey also to, to attack uh, infrastructure, to commit war crimes, to uh, violate international law without uh, without there's uh, outcry, without there's uh, media uh, attention on it. So for this uh, also uh, seminars or webinars like this, uh, we are yeah, you invited us today are very important to uh, draw attention and to let also speak the people from the ground who are seeing uh, what is uh, really happening and seeing the uh, yeah how the uh, this uh, democratic system built up and how we are ready uh, any how the people are ready to defend it are really believing in it because it's their own system it's uh, they're participating uh, democratically yes. Thank Thanks. you so much, Tara. And I will let you know that uh, uh, attendees that uh, there is a list of readings that will be shared because in this short time, we're engaging some ideas, but uh, really to draw from the the very powerful example of what uh, uh, women and uh, the community of Roha has um, has done is uh, a much longer process. So we will go, Ken. Thank you, Stara. Thank you, also. Yeah, thank you so much, Stara. That was just so complete and so quick. And I think that, that I would be remiss if I didn't start by using three seconds of my time 
to hold a moment of silence for um, Kurdish political prisoners and political prisoners all across the globe. As, as we hold those people near and dear to our hearts, I think it's really important that as we think about, as we talk about technology and the role of technology in revolutionary struggle, to think about one, <clears throat> what is the role of the state and also recognize that revolution is radical change and ideally change for autonomy and for liberation. This week I've been sitting with uh, an interview I read of Estela, by some words from Estela Diaz, who is the Argentine Minister of Gender and Diversity. And she said in that interview, transformations are always collective. That makes me think so much about the confederation or the confederation model or the collectivist models that are currently in Rojava and in a lot of places that are abandoned by the state. When we think about mutual aid, et cetera, those are systems and systems are technology. So also, as we have this conversation today, I'm hopeful that we start to demystify what we think about technology because technology comes from so many different and organic places. It comes from what, what white historians call prehistoric times where the First Nations, the original people of these territories, like I'm in New York, the original people of Turtle Island, they had extensive democratic processes, systems of crops, et cetera, that are really high, high technology. So as we talk about technology, let's make sure that we don't surrender the use of that word just to like what happens on a computer or what happens over the internet. The second, I, I think, important concept comes from the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition, where I was fortunate enough to be a co-founder of that coalition in Los Angeles. And uh, Stop LAPD Spine was work is working in Skid Row with unhoused folks to counter the surveillance state. One of the things that we put as central to that struggle was power, not paranoia. So one of the things that I also want us to avoid in our conversations about technology is this defeatism of they have more money, they have more tools, et cetera. We have people and people will never be beat. And I think that's what every and every um, anti-colonial struggle is evidence of that concept. So I would say as we start to talk about the role of technology and revolution to think about like, what is our fight? How do we learn about the fights that other people are, are holding? Um, when I think that's just such a perfect um, connection to what Stara has, has shared so far. And also what does self-determination look like? So even in our tool selection, when we're thinking about about technology tools, what does it look to have self-determination and how is it okay that this is not um, that this is not something that is um, a simple decision of if you use this tool, you're good. If you're this tool, you're bad. Um, and so going back to what do we mean by technology? So I like to think of technology as just any type of lever that we could use to further collaboration, connection, and life. So even today, just thinking how we started off using music as a powerful technology that brings us together. The grounding exercise that Mel had us go through, that's also a powerful technology. And just thinking that any system that gives us leverage to get free, like that's a technology. And there are some systems of control. And I think that, that when we're when Stara was speaking about um, the geographic borders and, and the geographically located oppressors, um, I think that's a it, it's important to situate um, borders as a technology of division and control. So just thinking of Kurdistan, Kashmir, the Adivasi folks in, in India um, or in the south in the Indian subcontinent, um, Palestine, Western Sahara, Puerto Rico. All the oppressive tools that are developed in the West are field tested there. And so also keeping in mind that as people who sometimes it's easy to believe that is not our struggle, that is really our struggle because those tools come here to where we live, like me as someone who lives in like the belly of the beast, but also they hurt our brothers and sisters and our family wherever they are. And thinking about like counterinsurgency tools as, as part of that as well. So I also want to highlight um, how there are wonderful exercises that take folks through what revolutionary technology could look like. I really want to shout out my friends at the Progressive Technology Project, 
um, and May 1st who have worked on a, um, on a timeline. Um, and it's brilliant because it was one of those examples where using technology, using meeting technologies, we're able to see like, oh, our original, the original timeline was very US centric. And so now there's an effort with some of our friends, particularly from Latin America, to see how do we make this actually an internationalist timeline so we can understand where we are at this moment in time and what is our history or our legacy as a movement. And I think that uh, also, just uh, how within that timeline, it's really clear and beautiful how modern technology, and we can call it high tech if we want to, um, has been leveraged by movements such as the Zapatistas, the folks in, in Rojava, and other liberation struggles to amplify their message to make sure that the violence of colonialism doesn't happen in the dark, that it's not something that we can say we didn't know, etc. So thinking how that is so important. And also, I think in terms of what is um, what is this Aranda, what is developing, what is developing is um, in Latin America and in Rojava, there are wonderful, exciting conversations about what would new technology look like that is developed from a feminist lens. I think in in technology that is a technology is for me is a terrain of struggle because I think for too long we have let, um, other people who only have the interest of creating money run that space. So how do we also make that a uh, terrain of struggle so we don't just give up the tools that we are going to use to get free? Because that is a very losing proposition that if we were counting on someone else's tools, the tools that we don't control. Um, and I'll say, and I'll say like, even, even today using this platform, just three years ago, um, Leila Khalid, um, we were doing working on something with someone from San Francisco State, and uh, Zoom just pulled the plug on that because someone complained and they said, "Oh, this is against our terms of services." Recently, um, I believe Eventbrite just did that for Palestinian youth movement. So, thinking once again, what are our fallback technologies that allow us the autonomy we need to build movements of life and movements of freedom? Um, and also, given how modern technology is developed and funded. What would decolonial technology look like? I don't know. I'm excited. There are wonderful conversations happening about that. And I think that if we if we if we understand how technology, even things like potentially 3D house printing, how do we use technology to to stop um, climate collapse because we know that the capitalists aren't going to stop climate collapse? So so also in those things. Um, I, I would also, in terms of shout outs, giving um, um, just so many props. And there's a, a little zine a booklet from a collective in Mexico, Surciendo, that explores these wonderful ideas. And it actually made me think a lot about, um, about this conversation um, because the, they have this concept, the Surciendo folks, of digital communality, communi communality which I think is just so fascinating and so ties in to some of the new democratic processes, not new, but the democratic processes that folks in Rojava are experimenting with. Um, and I think like that itself holds a lot of pro promise. I think one of our big challenges as we think about how we're going to get free and the role of technology in our collective liberation is how are we going to build infrastructure? When? Who's going to pay for it? Um, what does that infrastructure look like? How do we make sure that infrastructure doesn't center itself in what we call the first world or the West or whatever we want to call like the heart of empire? Um, so I, I think for me, that's going to be one of the more interesting challenges as we head towards towards many more crises in um, in our current time. What would that look like? And also just how do we build networks Kind of like what what I feel Melanie is is helping us do here to share information, share ideas, or share questions, because I have more questions than anything else. And with that, I will cede my 20 remaining seconds back. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Ken. Yes, we're in this very important moment of drawing the connections so that we may use them to build that world we know is possible. Next, we will call and uh, there are there is a um, there's information being put into the chat for you. 
Uh, and uh, if there are questions that have already arisen in your mind, uh, feel free to add them to the chat. We'll be gathering them. And in the question and answer, we'll get to as many as we can. We now call on Abba from the Himalayas for no doubt and in inspirational uh, comments. Abba, are you able to join us? I wonder if something happened with the internet. Uh, I will, as we wait for Abba, I will uh, note that the, there is a link to further readings and uh, resources on genealogy and Kurdistan, as well as some links to, to learn more about the webinar hosts and issues being discussed. Um, okay. Abba, are you able to join us? Okay, she may be having difficulty with her internet. And oh, there she is. Perfect. Ava, you can unmute and um, share your comments with us. We look forward to what you have to say. Yeah, I must admit that I lost my presentation. So I put some thoughts together. Uh, first of all, to, to begin with, I salute the Kurdish women's struggle, especially to those of our women who have evolved a doctrine title, Jin. Jian Asati, Kurdish women words for that is women, life, and freedom. I think we will vouch for it. We women rise and want Azadi. Uh, just a sh short uh, kind of a, a feeling, emotion, women mobilizing against possession, appropriation, violent appropriation of the Heimat, the land of our ancestors. No more to prove we belong. Scattered and yet united across nation states with Chilean, chilling scream, ethnicity matters. Fierce fight for citizenship of our land. We Kurdish women rise like a piercing storm in the occupied land for a country of our own. We dream peace. Um, what I was listening, that far, war is far from over and it's being fought on the bodies of women. I want to begin by stating that boundaries need to be questioned, assailed, and destabilized, but once erected, they persist at, as constant provocation. The construction of boundary offers challenge towards penetration rather than demolition. On boundaries, enormous variation and threats of solidarity are located simultaneously. It is through the fissures in the boundaries, the process of rebellion flows. And that's my understanding of the Kurdish women's struggle for their own homeland. Today, we are living in a militarized zones everywhere. We are conversing today against the backdrop of deafening ongoing genocide of Palestinian people, the war, war zone of Ukraine, and decimation of Afghan people, especially women. And in all this, women are at the center of aggression of the enemy, Taliban to ISIS to Hamas, and many more as our conversation unfolds. However, the women are rising everywhere in this globe, throwing their veils, holding their guns, and building an autonomous homeland. The Kurdish community is one of the world's largest peoples without a state, making up a sizable minority in Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. So that's the kind of a location. The century-old fight for rights, autonomy, and even an independent Kurdistan has been marked by violent attack, displacement, and persecution. And in spite of Kurds being the largest minority group in Turkey, they have suffered the violation of their polit 
political and cultural right. In the conflict in Syria, Turkey has played a pernicious role. In September 2014, ISIS launched an attack on the North Syrian Kurdish city of Kobani, center of the Kobani canton. The population of dozens of towns and villages in the area were assaulted by ICC, killing many and forcing 100,000 to flee across the border into Turkey. The armed conflict began between the Kurdish PKK, Kurdish Workers' Party, guerrillas, and the Turkish state has continued with, with varying degrees of intensity since the early 1980s. Can you imagine that 43, 42 years of this struggle continues and there is no sight in terms of peace and really understanding of what women are demanding. There's so many casualties and displacing large number of civilians in Southeast Turkey. It is historically well established that war and conflicts impact women disproportionately in multiple ways. It is evident that Kurdish women experience the Kurdish-Turkish conflict not only as members of an ethnic minority, but also as women in their multiple identity. What I find amazing is the resilience and the, the commitment to struggle and continue fighting as they feel they need to just continue rising, shouting and screaming for their rights to land and home. Sexual violation of women prisoners and the sexual mutilation of women guerrillas fighters have been an ongoing onslaught in the ever-increasing struggle for self liberation Women's bodies and sexualities as object of violation are used as war strategies. All of us know it, have known it for centuries. Yet their active role and participation in war and militant organization in defense of their communities, their nation and nationalist projects continues. The rising and con <clears throat> consideration, uh, consolidation of rights to life and voice continues. The historical relationship between women and war is right, largely mediated by their bodies used as symbolic expression of the process of occupation, Extreme, extermination and subjugation of one people by another through the systemic violation of women and girls' rights. Kurdish women live a triple struggle against the Daesh, against the national oppression of their people by the different states of the Middle East and into which Kurdistan is divided and last but not least, against patriarchy. In this fight, their bodies, their, hand, their bodies and their hands, Daesh fighters are put into panic by them. Since if they die at the hands of a woman, they will not go to paradise. Very interesting how women are defined. Uh, it is the imposition of imperial Nationalism, corporate mega empires ending as a fight of civilization. Women have evolved a complex understanding of war and violence, especially Kurdish women, where inclusivity, the perspective of intersectionality, and the dream of peace coexist. The freedom of the Kurdish people can be viewed as inseparably bound to women's freedom. This statement emphasizes a core tenet in the reinvention of the PKK's ideology as articulated by Oklan, the understanding that freedom can only be achieved through the defeat of the patriarchal system. And I think Kurdish women have actually exemplified this in, in, with amazing, amazing courage and resilience. The women of the PKK and its sister PYT represent the embodiment of the PKK's new ideology, attracting international attention following Kurdish efforts to establish an autonomous region of governance in Northeast Syria. In the meeting in September 2022, very recently, Okalan asked, can the nation state that operates as a colony of capital 
that reproduces patriarchal relations of domination truly be a vehicle of liberation for liberation? Is the point for all people to get a state of their own or to dismantle this imposed imperialist model in favor of a new vision of stateless world democracy? I love this, the way it is articulated based on self-governance, communal economy, and a new vision of social ecology. I think this is what is the core of the struggle of Kurdish women. Although women are historically ignored and being part of the civil wars, and Kurdish women have really equally, at times even more fiercely, fought against the perpetrators of violence and have stepped out of their traditional roles as women, as wives, as daughters, as sisters. They have risen as really a force of combatants. We witness very high participation of women in combating attack on their heimat and their bodies, both synonymous in the eyes of aggressor as they increase their aggression to appropriate both. Uh, what I would like to end with, because my time is most probably running out, in the voice of Kurdish women, we have gained confidence and trust in ourselves. We did not simply follow established policies, but also took part in creating new policies. We came onto the street with new innovative slogans. We challenged not just the state's perspective, but also the established rules of society. The male-dominated political establishment usually does not make women's issues their main argument. However, day by day, women's participation and active demanding of their rights while coming out onto street has been increasing. When women come onto the street for a demonstration, some of them bring along their children, others leave their husbands at home to look after the children. This is something that Kultan Kisonek said. To end my presentation, we will continue with our dangerous fantasies and reasonable hope. The Kurdish women's movement holds a mirror for the global women's struggle against ruthless, patriarchal, capitalist, militarized domination inside and across our border. Not only the resilience, but also the create creativity of the struggle will continue and survive. Thanks. I mean, uh... Usually Zoom now will send up some applause or, or um, uh, fireworks of um, acknowledgement and appreciation. Abba, Ken, Stira. We, I will uh, take note that in our room here, we have at least 17 territories from Rojava, Kurdistan, Colombia, Himalayas, and India, and other parts of India, Copenhagen, Catalonia, Germany, England, Myanmar, Canada, Finland, Thailand, Indonesia, Brazil, other parts of Spain, the Dubai, Mexico, and the US. So I give thanks to all who, who in busy lives took time now to really both learn about the extraordinary uh, work as well as um, intensified moment of struggle. The next, uh, we will uh, actually have three prepared questions that uh, will be put in the chat in um, all our languages and uh, ask that each of the speakers has uh, three minutes uh, to respond. As you can see, the questions are about what do we do about to overcome everything related to media embargo, censorship, and false information. What urgent actions can we do? And how can we strengthen our networks of solidarity? So uh, Stira, could we start with you? Okay, can you see me now? No. You have to. We can hear you. Okay, I cannot turn on my camera because you have to allow it, the moderation. 
or the one who's like making the techniques. But I... we can go to Ken and come back. Thank you, Ken. Well, I'll see to Stara. Stara. Oh, I see Stara. Okay. Right. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, uh, thank you to Ken and also to uh, Abba for their speaks. It was very inspired, inspiring. Uh, thank you. And uh, to the questions, uh, I want to point out, of course, there's a need of resistance, not only against the physical attacks, but also against the special warfare uh, that is being waged through media and through false propaganda. And uh, we... Uh, have seen also in the past that international solidarity is uh, really an important means of drawing attention to situations in order to break this uh, media embargo on some uh, topics. How I said, uh, for example, this uh, webinar is a way to um, make people aware of, uh, of it, but also to take uh, actions and uh, to uh, yeah, take part in local campaigns and actions to attract uh, attention. For example, uh, there is uh, the Women Defend Rojava campaign. Uh, this campaign started 2019, shortly before the invasion attack, uh, the new uh, a new invasion attack on Grisby and Serekanir. And uh, there are women from all over the world, uh, 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 yeah, joined this uh, campaign, built up like uh, groups uh, and made a lot of different uh, actions uh, in frame of the campaign to draw attention, to defend the revolution, the women's revolution. And uh, I think also that these actions played an important role in raising public awareness. And there's also the campaign raising a uh, rise up for Rojava, uh, which also plays an important uh, role in making aware on the situation, not just only on uh, digital media, uh, I don't want to use the word social media, but on digital media, and also uh, in, act in form of uh, demonstrations, actions to make aware in different places. And for example, we also see, uh, especially in the war, uh, in, in, in the fight against the Islamic States in Kobani, uh, Abba also mentioned Kobani. For example, there we saw that there was a lot of uh, international solidarity. And I think uh, it changed a lot because uh, there were so much demonstrations, so much also on social media, like uh, people were like talking, uh, yeah, and you were like uh, bring it, bring it, yeah, and raising public awareness. And this uh, it makes pressure on the different states, on um, uh, news agencies on news companies to really also to 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 write about it or the political uh, responsible to uh, to respond on uh, on the topic so to make pressure on this uh, way and for example the in, uh, the campaign uh, for example the women defend Rojava campaign uh, their internationalists are taking uh, an active role and important role in this campaign but they also have contact to the to the Kurdish structures and their locals and to uh, other uh, groups uh, other anti-fascist anti um uh, yeah, any feminist groups, uh, democratic forces in their locals, building connection and uh, working together with uh, uh, with uh, to defend the women's revolution and in connection with the women's yeah, any, with the women's movement, for example, here in Rojava, but also connecting in their locals with the different uh, organizations and uh, yeah, practicing uh, solidarity. And uh, yes. Um, how I said, there are actions like um, different uh, um, actions you can make, not just demonstrations, but demonstrations like making uh, creative, cre creative uh, uh, actions to where, to uh, raise awareness. Seminars like this, seminar like seminars and webinars, the online seminars and on also seminars in the locals. 
And uh, yes, social media, uh, especially on the topic of tech, any uh, the new techniques uh, there, you can also, we also saw, for example, uh, for um, Israel, uh, the, uh, and for the Palestinian people, that there were a lot of uh, outcry of a lot of making aware on, so, on digital media. It was all, it's also an important tool we have to use how can also said we cannot uh, leave uh, this space just for the ones who have interest in uh, making war or uh, yeah or want to raise money with, with uh, this and yes at this point i also would also call to to to, to participate in uh, campaigns like uh, women defend rojava or rise up uh, for Rojava, and also for those who are interested, also to visit Rojava to see what's what is built up, what we are defending. Uh, uh, yes, and this I would also propose to everyone who are interested to see by themselves how the situation here is, how the new system is built up. I think my three minutes are over. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, we're just. This is a moment in time. And there's a lot of suggestions being made in the chat of uh, material for uh, further uh, uh, reading and viewing. Uh, please, for the attendees, also feel free to put comments, ideas, and questions in the chat. We'll now hear from Ken and Abba uh, uh, very, very briefly about their uh, thoughts on what can be done related to the questions that were posed and then open it for comments and questions from attendees. Totally, I'm gonna e echo a lot of what Stara brilliantly mapped out. And I, I think the short version for me is networks, build networks of trust and build cross location movements of solidarity. Don't be afraid to do it. In the US, a lot of folks are afraid of things like material support laws, et cetera. Then focus on humanitarian aid. Find out what people need on the ground and figure out how to be part of that. I also want to take a brief pause for the um the the with Stara just so adore that that Stara raised the the fact of internationalists, folks actually showing up. There is a long historical tradition of internationalism where people actually go and fight for what they believe. And I think it's important that even if one is not going to take that role in a, in a liberation struggle, to think about how do we highlight the incongruencies or the, the lies of the imperial states when it's okay for anyone to go fight in the Ukraine, but people, an acquaintance of mine was deported from Turkey because they felt they were going to go fight um, with the Kurdish militias. So just thinking, and how do we like amplify these things? And I think this goes to the, the issue of misinformation, malinformation or fake information is I think if we build more networks of trust, it's a lot harder to fall into those pitfalls. Um, and I, I think the, the last piece is also, how do we have more spaces like this where, where I think it's important for us to to create that space, especially those of us who are not um, connected um, to these territories and struggle, um, to learn about revolutionary struggle and and amplify that in in any way shape that we can. That's all now. Abba. Okay, when Abba is able to connect in, then we will give that space. Uh, uh, again, Abba, your words were very powerful and included many ideas about how we build forward. So uh, uh, we have, I'm just oh, saying a few, Go few ahead. things in there. I'm just saying one idea that I have uh, is that to build what I call the alternative feminist uh, media lighthouse to actually uh, undo the false uh, false media uh, 
outcry by the powerful media controlled by the by the aggressors and by the uh, occupants of our territories the other thing that I, I i would like to add that kurdish women's struggle cannot be seen in isolation of all the struggles that are going on all over the globe. So if we can build a solidarity action platform and continue this conversation and really propagate our strategies, multiple strategies, one issue that hasn't really been uh, kind of propagated is the entire issue of inclusivity and multiple sexual identities. How do they uh, play a significant role in really building this solidarity? action across identities and across nation state. The last but not the least is my suggestion that Melanie, the way you have really uh, uh, envisaged and conceptualized this event, if we can continue with these kind of um, uh, conversation and start thinking, how do we build a solidarity against a very powerful, very, a cruel uh, conspiracy. And I think there is a complete uh, solidarity among the enemies around us that how do we actually fight against them and dismantle their power. So that's what I would like to do as a feminist that says that not only the territories, but the ecological uh, uh, occupation of this mother earth along with the humanity is our future. That's it. Okay, Melanie. thank you so much, Abba. Um, so we now turn to, uh, we have about, um, I guess about 12 minutes um, uh, before we have closing words from our uh, Rojava comrades. And I see one question, um, if we can get, uh, have uh, other questions um, being um, raised. Uh, I don't know, Stira, would you like to um, speak to this Question, um, is there any network of resistance being built between women in Rojava and Palestine? Uh, for this question, there is not a direct, yeah, there are uh, connections between women uh, from Palestine and women in Rojava. We are uh, organizing uh, in different initiatives there's uh, one initiative uh, of women from the Middle East uh, against occupation and genocide. And there, for example, are also a woman from Palestine uh, in this uh, initiative. We are organizing, yeah, and on this space, we are organizing together like seminars like this today, uh, uh, common statements on different topics. But uh, I have also, I think also the situation in Palestine, um, the, uh, I think also the NGOization in the region and also uh, the current war made it very difficult for women uh, to, to organize uh, also. And there's also the uh, great impact of uh, Hamas. It also makes for us difficult to make more connections in uh, Palestine, but uh, for sure, we are in solidarity. Yani, there's a, a connection and a solid base of solidarity between uh, women, Palestinian women, who are like uh, for a democratic solution, who are like uh, yes, also having uh, common goals. Uh, yes, but uh, on this topic, we also have to work more, more uh, closely. I think it's important, especially now the situation uh, now in. Uh, Palestine and um, yeah, in, in general, there need to be more. Uh, in the past, there was more in the 19th and the 18th, more uh, solidarity between the Palestinian and Kurdish uh, women. But now it's like, uh, uh, yeah, we are organizing in this different, there are different initiatives. Uh, yes, where are women from not the 
the Middle East are organized together, especially Arab uh, women also in this uh, initiatives. We're working yani, with them and are also together in different other initiatives like World Women's March uh, and other initiatives together with the women in Palestine. Thank you, Stira. I see a question for any of you, all of you, uh, start, starting with Ken. Uh, do you see any potential in redefining technology and broadening our imagination as to what it could entail? For example, can't we also consider all the radically democratic bottom up and feminist ways of organizing and distributing resources created in Rahaba and other places also as forms of technology. Ken? Yeah, thanks so much. And, and Dania, that is just, yeah, I think that we're doomed if we don't do that. I, th I think that if we keep seeing technology as an area that that is the definition of which is determined by other people and usually by our oppressors or by commercial interests, we're totally doomed. I, I think that 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 we need to see what are the ways that we can do all of this differently in a way that is more inclusive. And I think the way of doing that is identifying what are what does feminist um, oriented principled led, I still don't have like the right word for it, but how does this lens inform us? Because clearly the reason we're in, in, in the moment in time of crisis that we are is because I think it's just been De determined in such a masculinist um, lens that that I think we have to. And like I said, it's like all these things are, are technologies. Like for me, I always say my favorite technology is uh, pen and paper because, you know, it helps me get things done. And that's what a technology is. Um, and I, I think the bottom up piece is also super important. So I think how we design any system we have to really shift to like more democratic, inclusive models of design and not designing like for like a Western audience that counts on like fast tools and networks and all this other stuff and, and the disposability of tech as well. Or I think that's another area where I think the way that some feminist thinkers are exploring this also factors that that waste in accessibility, waste things that that a lot of, of, of male technologists aren't, aren't really keen to or aware of, et cetera. Um, and yeah, I would love to hear um, Abba and Stara's thoughts on that. I would, I think this is a, a quite amazing what you have sh just shared. Uh, I personally feel that women have a different ways of, uh, of, of, of narrative that we have evolved. And this technology can be challenged also changed its forms by women's voices that we can actually uh, amplify through different ways of saying my stories, my uh, resilience, my way of dealing with these realities, really creating a different uh, ways of uh, combating or really challenging this technological warfare that's going on, which is primarily based on lies and false assumptions. Therefore, I'm of the opinion that women need to come together to evolve an entirely different language, different ways of communicating that we, we know for centuries and uh, amplifying it for larger audience in a language that actually communicates our agenda of peace, security, equity, and democratic kind of voices uh, to propagate an ideology of, of feminist imagination of alternative way of life and living and creating an entirely different, uh, uh, different concept of what does it mean to live together yet accepting the differences and uh, various identities that we carry inside us. I, I agree with, uh, with uh, Ken and uh, Abba. And I just want to uh, 
I didn't want to add uh, so much to it, but I think also that it's uh, we are using it already techniques or um, modern technique to uh, build up networks to connect to um, yeah to exchange. But uh, I also think that that we can uh, do much more and also uh, it's it have risks and also. Uh, uh, yeah, risks like the security risk that everything you 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 do you you speak can be uh, also uh, yeah listened to. But uh, there are also ways of alternate you know, alternative ways for security on uh, cyber security, and uh, I think it's important also to develop uh, this kind of things uh, and to develop also the. Um, the using of uh, te te techniques and uh, modern technique uh, because it's ma it make it's, it make it's also more easier to really participate yeah, to make uh, solidarity to build up solidarity and net networks and uh, yes I think uh, we can use it more to build up the di digital uh, councils to to exchange more and also in a digital uh, way there are also some uh yeah some uh, in Rojava for example some uh, yeah tr they try yeah they they build up some uh, digital uh, councils to spread and uh, different topics and to make aware of different topics and to encourage people to also make aware of it so I think it can also be an important tool to connect and also to make. Uh, yeah, uh, aware of situations. Thank you. And as each of you, the speakers, prepare a uh, maybe a one minute closing thoughts, please integrate Nujin's question, how can oppressed people use technology as tools of solidarity and cooperation into your closing remarks? Before we go to that, we have a request from somebody um, uh, who will share the relationship of uh, this conversation also to what's been in con the Congo. Um, the, this is uh, the executive director of Friends of the Congo, Maurice Carney, if you want to share a, a, a one or two minutes, well, we're happy to hear your remarks. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Melanie, and uh, peace, peace and blessings uh, to everyone. Thank you for the uh, uh, insightful presentation. Uh, one uh, element that, that, that struck me uh, in the exchange is the, the question of solidarity, uh, which our organization, uh, Friends of the Congo, uh, is a pan-African solidarity uh, institution. Uh, we're in solidarity with the people in the uh, part of the African continent in particular, uh, Congolese and uh, Africans in, in general. Uh, and we're also uh, internationalists uh, in the tradition of, uh, even me myself, I'm, I'm Jamaican native, uh, but uh, I, uh, I draw up on the inspiration of uh, figures like uh, uh, Amy uh, Ashford Garvey uh, uh, from uh, Jamaica, CLR James, uh, George Padmore, uh, just a whole uh, Walter Rodney, a host of uh, people from the Caribbean who have uh, pursued a pan African solidarity path and an international uh, path. Uh, so, uh, wanted to uh, really uh, make a statement about uh, the centrality and the importance of uh, solidarity uh, and also uh, segue that into a question uh, and to the speakers, uh, to Ken and others. To what extent is there has there been an outreach to the African continent overall, um, particularly in light of uh, Turkish uh, increased engagement on the African continent? Uh, social movements in, in Africa uh, see countries like Turkey and India and other countries that are engaging uh, the African continent as a counterbalance to the traditional. European colonial uh, uh, domination of Africa. Uh, therefore, they 
may not go beyond behind the, the curtain, so to speak, and see the, the way Turkey is behaving in its um, uh, sphere of influence. Uh, so I'd be interested to hear uh, what uh, Pan-African solidarity institutions, such as Friends of the Congo and social movements in Africa, uh, can do uh, to, uh, to be uh, in solidarity with uh, the work and the organizing that is, uh, that is taking place. Uh, so I just wanted to use my time to, to center the question of solidarity. Uh, Congo has suffered the deadliest conflict in the world since World War II as a result of uh, uh, neocolonial and imperialist forces. Uh, estimated 6 million people have perished in the country in the scramble for its resources. Uh, and uh, even today, as uh, Palestine is uh, suffering uh, under, uh, experiencing an acute suffering under uh, the uh, Israeli offensive, uh, we see uh, people lifting up uh, other struggles uh, in tandem, uh, struggles on the African continent, uh, Sudan, uh, Congo, even uh, Haiti. Uh, so uh, Friends of the Congo is in communication and collaboration with these with forces in these different countries, and we'd love to be uh, in collaboration and in support uh, with your your fight and your struggle. Uh, so please uh, share with us uh, the extent to which there's been outreach on the continent and uh, how uh, Africans at home and abroad uh, can be in support of the organizing and work that you're doing. Thank you, Maurice. The theme, Thank obviously, you, solidarity. Um, each of the speakers, uh, uh, you have one minute, or uh, if you, um, and then we will have closing from our comrades in in uh, uh, Rojava, and we have a hard end at twelve thirty, as as some of the interpreters will um, need to leave. So um, I'm, Stira, would you like to? Um, particularly um, this question, how do we use technology as tools of solidarity cooperation or any remark you would like to make as closing? And again, it's uh, limited really to about a minute and then <laughs> Servine will, will close us out. Go ahead. Okay, okay. I uh, thank you again for this important uh uh webinar and today also we saw that it's very important to build up solidarity international internationalist solidarity because our fight is we saw see it's one fight uh, we have to overcome patriarchy capitalism and nationalism colonialism and uh, different other ways um practice of oppression or systems of oppression and we are all affected from it uh, maybe in different ways uh, but uh, we are all have the same enemy and because of this it's important to uh, yeah to make sometimes yeah to make this kind of uh, seminars also to 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 see it and show it that uh, we have a common uh, uh, struggle or oh, we have to have a common struggle we have to struggle together and uh, also thank you for maurice for his, his uh, uh yeah for his uh, speak and i think that um, we already use uh, technical techniques yeah, uh, me media for building up uh, international solidarity for example the zapatistas also and made a call for the 14th to uh, participate in solidarity to uh, send messages uh, for the release of one of their uh, uh, comrades who is in prison uh, since more than two years. And uh, yes, we as Congress star, we will make a video for this. And maybe we think sometimes it's something small to do, but uh, the impact is uh, sometimes um, yeah, is bigger because we also saw when people send messages of solidarity, it gives also hope uh, to our struggle and it gives, gives also strength uh, to us. And uh, we hope all, yani, how Abbas said, for example, that um, the struggle of the women here also gave hope and strength to other women. We also gain strength and hope by seeing their solidarity with our struggle. And um, yes, I think uh, 
in this time in times of in, you know, now media or digital uh, techniques and uh, different modern technique uh, we have to use uh, more stronger to organize different important days uh, to make aware on different topics and um, thank you again for the invitation and for this uh, seminar Melanie, right. I just want to want to say at the end that solidarity of resistance all over the world that women are actually taking forward it should be uh, one of the ways to fight against the kind of uh, false uh, use of technology and against our resistance is something that we need to work on further. Ken? Yeah, building on, on Abba's uh, um, invitation, there's so many things to work on further. I do want to recognize and really address and, and thank Maurice for, for their intervention, because to me, it really invites me to think about how um, anti-Blackness manifests itself in even in the struggles that I am I am aware of and supporting, et cetera, where I, I where I think just um, apart from Haiti, and that's just more mostly in an immigration deportation context, um, just how we are not taught to be in solidarity or even encouraged to be in solidarity with Black struggle. And how do we kind of root ourselves that that's a transformation we need to have, that I need to have in terms of like, oh yeah, there is there are global struggles everywhere and all our all these struggles for liberation deserve all our attention. And, and how do we split that in a way that is more um, that is more just and builds the world that we want where one group is not um, preferenced over another? Like, so thanks for that intervention, Maurice the seeds of a next conversation. Servine, I'm going to pass this for you to share closing thoughts. And of course I give big, big great thanks to all involved. You're muted. Can't hear you. It's very, very low. Can you turn the mic volume? It's better now? Perfect. Okay. Go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, on behalf of all the friends here from the Genealogy Academy in Rojava, I would also like to thank everybody who uh, took part in realizing this webinar. Special thanks to Melanie and Nurshan and Nejibil, who have been also part of the organizing team. Melanie also for the uh, moderation and of course uh, Stera, Ken and Abba who shared uh, their thoughts their experiences of struggle in life uh, and I really really uh, appreciate it and I agree with uh, the thing that was raised uh, we should see this uh, discussion as a starting point uh, or uh, another step to continue with uh, a special thank also to our translators, Nora, Jelly, and Aldo, and uh, the great technical support team. Uh, and yeah, all the other steps uh, and uh, the GTA Women's Assembly and the sharing that made it possible to come together with all uh, of uh, the participants today. So for me, really, uh, this webinar has been like a sunshine in the middle of dark times. I feel it a bit like this uh, in a time of devastation. Uh, we need like to spread these seeds of hopes uh, for strengthening our common struggles against war, against genocides, against feminicides, against the 
destruction of nature, of the destruction of Mother Earth and the neglect of human values. And um, as we chose for uh, the title of the seminar, Sp Spreading Our Resistance Against Occupation and Technology Warfare, for me, it means to insist on a life uh, in freedom and dignity, uh, on a life in collectivity and solidarity. And uh, spreading resistance means also to break the silence and indifference towards uh, wars of occupation and crimes against humanity in any place of uh, the world. Um, this resistance, spreading resistance, means to dismantle the lies of global powers and nation states uh, that pretend to fight terrorism, but actually are terrorizing the people committing genocide, destroying water, electricity, and energy supplies, uh, destroying schools and hospitals to occupy the land and breaking people's will or making people displacing from their land. Um, spreading resistance also means to overcome the isolation and censorship that has been imposed on the thoughts and existence of Abdullah Ejalan uh, on the revolutionary movement and the organized society in Kurdistan. So spreading resistance means for us also uh, to fight for the freedom of Abdullah Öcalan and all political prisoners. Spreading resistance means uh, to dismantle the lies of a capitalist system of exploitation that talks about progress and smartness, but actually strives to control and manipulate our thoughts, uh, feelings, actions, our ways of life. And it means to develop ecological technologies, media platforms, and networks that are based on ethical and democratic values. Um, spreading resistance means also to reject uh, patriarchal concepts of dominance and submission, to stand up and organize uh, our self-defense against uh, feminicides and any kind of uh, oppression. So in this sense, our exchanges and discussions today, uh, talking and listening carefully to each other have been a very meaningful step in our common search for truth and justice. And it has been an expression of solidarity to defend Rojava against uh, the continuing occupy, occupation attacks of Turkey. Just as Dela mentioned uh, today, the last night, uh, the shell bombing continues, the planes are in the air. So. Why is it so important to defend Rojava? Uh, defending Rojava means for us to defend a women's revolution, and it means to defend and practice the idea of a democratic nation, of, of democratic confederalism, in which all communities and cultures can express their own will, their own identity, but uh, determine and organize a common life right, together. Um, it means to be build people's councils, ecological cooperatives, women's collectives, and so on in any region of the world. And if any region of the world can be a part of this process that ch challenges uh, state power and colonialism. So defending Rojava actually starts uh, wherever we are. We can, uh, so the most important thing is really to defend the hope and commitment that another life, a free society, is possible. And as a concrete suggestion for action, um, I think uh, I would like to suggest, uh, because the 25th of November is close, the International Day to eliminate all forms of violence against women, I think this can be a next step to link our local and global agendas to a common struggle against occupation, war, and uh, genocidal attacks that are targeting the people in the region uh, of Rojava, as well as the Palestinian people in the Gaza and uh, other occupied territories, and of course, in other uh, territories of the world. Uh, and uh, yes, also our solidarity from here. Uh, to the people that are fighting uh, for uh, the right uh, to freedom and justice in, in Africa, in the in Sudan, uh, in the um, in Mexico, in different uh, regions of the world, and but uh, for the twenty fifth of November, I think uh, it's very nice if we could relate to example of the 
uh, people's resistance uh, that overthrew the dictatorship in the Dominican Republic as an answer to the assassination of the Mirabel sisters in uh, 1960. So today we have uh, the slogan Jinjian Azadi, Women Life uh, Freedom, that is spreading from Kurdistan to many places in the world. And uh, it became known with the uprisings against the killing of Nina Imini by Iranian state forces and uh, symbolizes at the same time the essence of over 40 years of revolutionary struggle for the self-determination of women and the Kurdish people. So um, within the history of this uh, freedom struggle or the history of uh, freedom struggles all around the world has taught us that while we are fighting against occupation, war and fascist dictatorships, uh, we have to insist on rebuilding our lives and relationships uh, on the basis of women's liberation, radical democracy, and Egypt, uh, ecological justice. Uh, this is nothing that we can leave uh, until a time after the revolution, because then there won't be any revolution. So uh, it is really important uh, that we see and feel the difference, uh, what it means uh, to, uh, to, to fight uh, for freedom uh, and to live according to this uh, in our daily lives uh, and in especially in this time where uh, the war oppression and feminicides uh, seem just uh, so um, uh, oppressive uh, or uh, seem to be so present everywhere it's even more uh, important to uh, start uh, to, or to make these uh, seeds of hope and resistance growing uh, stronger. Uh, and therefore, I would like to close uh, with a quote uh, from Abdullah Ejalan. Uh, he said, hope is even more important than victory. And in this sense, uh, we will continue our struggle, Jinjian, Azadi. Um, this is what uh, I would like to share uh, in the end uh, for us as uh, Genealogy Academy, uh, it has been uh, a very important learning process also to be part of the organizing team and also the sharings of uh, the friends and other contributions uh, like of the speakers as well as uh, the friends who joined to the discussions are very important. Uh, I thank you all and wish you good luck, Sir Captain. Jinjian Awadi. We will see you again, we hope soon. Yes. Thank you all for your attendance, your participation, for your generosity, for your existence, your resistance, for your for the power represented here. Thank you all. Thank you all, Sutu. Thank mm -hmm. you.